bring. All right, guys, welcome to episode one of the new live stream. The last one was episode zero with Joey Lefebvre. I told you guys we'd have special guests on for episode one. And uh, here's my buddy, Dave Park. Thanks for coming on, man. Ah, thanks for having me. I don't think you don't do really interviews. This is kind of like our first, isn't it? That's well, I've been on a couple podcasts and stuff that they've, uh, I mean, the different topics, you know, like one was for acting and yeah, so, uh, but yeah. You, you were involved in that coaching yeah, community for yeah, a while. Yeah, I was involved in, in like the executive life coaching community for a while and uh, then, yeah. Uh, recently on a podcast with an actor named uh, Jordan Murphy who, you know, uh, focuses mostly on actors, but... And, uh, well, I mean, why don't you go ahead, I'm sorry, I'm posting the links yeah. onto social media because I'm self-producing the show. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about your background because you served in the Marines, the Navy, and the Army. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so I started out in the Marine Reserve when I was uh, 19. And um, I spent a year in the Marine Reserves and then Desert Shield, Desert Storm started up. Uh, and I was in an angle code, but I was not, uh, I'd only been in for about a year and I wasn't airborne qualified. So I wasn't going to uh, deploy with like a thick team or whatever. And I was just really, really devastated. So I decided, you know, I wanted to go to war and I tried to enlist in the Marines, but they would, you know, or actively the Marines, but they wouldn't take me because, uh, because I was considered prior service since I was already in the reserve and they weren't taking prior service at the time. So then I actually went to the Navy to be a corpsman to go to war with the Marines. So I went to the Navy, had to go back to boot camp and uh, core school. And by the time I was done with core school, the war was over. So there I was in the Navy. So. Um, uh, so I became a hard hat diver, diving medical technician, um, and stationed on board the USS Samuel Compers. Uh, did my full four years there. Uh, got out, spent some time in the guard, um, bumming around, you know, San Francisco. How do you like that hard hat diving? Because like, I've been uh, really fortunate to make contact with a lot of Navy divers and even civilian industrial divers. Yeah. And like, those guys got their man card. Based like, on the stuff that they do. I'll tell you what, it, it, uh, you know, I, it's, 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 it was an amazing job. It was an amazing community. I mean, it's about as tight knit community as you as you could ask for. Um, I was on. I was stationed in the dive locker on a destroyer uh, tender. So I don't know what the ship's company was. Whether it's twelve hundred people, fourteen hundred people, whatever. But um, you know, and it was it was both men and women on the ship. Uh, there were like 12 or 13 divers. The dive locker was outside the skin of the ship. Everybody else was wearing dungarees. We were wearing uh, OD greens. So, you know, we, I don't know, there, there, there was sort of a superstar quality about it, you know, like we were the high school football team in a way, um, <laughs> which uh, obviously led to a lot of, a lot of problems. Um, uh, not problems, but, um, Stories, um, and the Navy's a little bit different than the Army, and but at least like like you were yeah, after that we we'll get into it, but you were a Ranger Battalion. Right. Then I went to yeah. Ranger. Big difference between let's say discipline. Massive difference. <laughs> well, it, yeah, yes. Big difference between discipline and uh, I don't know. It's like people often ask me if I enjoy being a diver better or. Ranger, but they're like, well, what did you like best? Or Marine. But to be fair, like, I try, even though, like, I did Marine boot camp and, and you know, um, MCT and then, you know, my uh, the artillery uh, uh, training or the Ford Observer training um, down at Fort Sill, like, I don't talk about being a Marine a whole lot, but it's only because I don't feel worthy of talking about, you know, I did it for a year as a reservist. So, it's one of those things where I'll often say I was in the Navy and the Army, and I only leave, I, I don't leave off the Marines because I don't, it, it's not because the Marines aren't worthy, it's because I'm not, you know what I mean? Because I don't, I don't really do, do my time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I feel like it's unfair, you know, to, to, uh, to throw that in there. Uh, and then it also sounds like a bunch of bullshit, you know? <laughs> so I wouldn't believe anybody who, who told me. 
Um, but yeah, people often ask me if if, um, if I like the uh, the Navy or the Army better, being a diver or being a ranger, basically. And and I, I love them both equally for for very different reasons. You know, for very different reasons. Um, the uh, the camaraderie in both of them were exceptional. The uh, Esprit de Corps and the, the you know, the brotherhood or, or, you know, the kinship there. Um, being a diver was just fun. I mean, it was hard, hard work. Like, you're talking about, you know, sometimes six, eight, ten hour bottom times. And underwater. You know, underwater, you know. Um, in, in, in San Francisco Bay, at, at Alameda is where I was based at. Um, so when you get to the point where your wetsuit, you know, it's just not working anymore. You know, like you're you're not generating, like you're you're in a full hypothermia. Um, but you know, if you're sitting there trying to measure things with a micrometer and while they're making adjustments topside, you're there's nothing you can do about it. You know, and of course, like any other military community, if if you tap out, yeah, it, you're never going to hear the end of it. So you don't tap out. You know, you just you just. I imagine, you know, like you guys must have been like trimmed down like 0% body fat. Oh yeah, like oh yeah. Being that, that much time in the water, oh, yeah. physically or under physical duress. Yes, and, and, and you know, generating, like, you know, just just the burning the calories, you know, for the, for the thermal benefits and everything. Yeah, um, for sure. Um, so that, it, that was just, uh, you know, amazing. And that was mostly like shallow depth uh, ship maintenance, right? Yeah, primarily. I mean, there would be, you know, if, if uh, a plane went down or a helicopter went down in the bay or something like that, um, you know, there, there, were, there were exceptions to the rule. And, um, you know, and the dive committee has their job. So, for instance, um, you know, a, a sea diver, you know, uh, um, you know, in an underwater construction or whatever, whatever they are, you know, like they may, I don't know if that's the actual term, but, but like a CV diver might do something else. And then you have other programs like um, the, uh, uh, what am I thinking? The, the saturation divers. And the EOD divers. Well, the EOD divers. But see, the EOD divers, yeah, the EOD divers went through quite a bit of dive training. Um, the saturation divers, though, so they were, they were, like, I couldn't be an EOD diver because that was its own its own thing. But I could have gone into like for, for instance saturation diving. That was sort of a branch of diving. But uh, you know, the thing is so what saturation diving is is basically going underwater for at depth, like way, you know, deep depth. If, if I don't say this to like try to one up you or anything. But this isn't my story. This I, I have a saturation diver story that was told to me. Yeah. Um it, I'll tell you if you're yeah, interested. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, so this is an old school, the old school Cold War, Cold Warrior, right? Um, at the time, back in the day, the Soviets were firing ballistic missiles out over the bay of uh, Kamchatka, where that peninsula comes down. And so if somebody got the right idea, like, we can bring our submarines in there and have saturation divers lock out of the submarines and, uh, you know, locate these ballistic missile components and recover them for intelligence value. Yeah. Which we did. Yeah. But then the next thing, the next evolution of that, they were like, well, the Soviets have underwater sea cables that are yeah. walking back and forth. Yeah. Like, Why don't we try to tap into yeah. that? And so what they did was they brought the subs up and they, like, at night, and then just with, like, periscopes and stuff, and they'd scan the horizon to see until they found the warning signs like, well, you know, like you see the construction sites, like warning, don't dig here, underground cable. And they're like, okay, that's where the cable is. So go back in the water and the saturation divers will lock out yeah. and go and tap into these cables. Yeah. And this gentleman I talked to, I can't get him to come on and tell the story himself. Sure, sure. There's classification sure. issues still involved. He would tell me stories about it, and he'd say, we would get the device, which at the time was like 12 feet long, which was huge. They would get it on there, and he said, we could dial down to every layer of the cable, listening to everything from top secret military communication that the Soviets were having, to some Soviet soldier um, playing Elvis records to his girlfriend in Moscow. That's amazing. Over the telephone. Yeah. And he was telling me about something when he would have to, so they would put this tap on, and then they would come back months later. 
And he said when they came back to recover the recordings, this is all analog, yeah. back in the old days, uh, the device, the first thing they had to do is clear all the snow cramps off because the things were just hounded, surrounded by snow cramps because of the warmth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The device was nuclear powered. It was a nuclear powered tape recorder that they, put, that they put on that cable. So they would they would um, clear all the traps off and like zip tie them to something else to get them to help to go away. Yeah. And then recover the analog. It was literally a huge tape deck. Yeah. And bring it back onto the sub. And I've had other people tell me that the technology has significantly improved since then. That now those caps are the size of like a briefcase. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, but tapping fiber is a huge thing that every intelligence agency in the world tries to do. Yeah. But anyway, I, I, I just thought that was a really interesting story. Yeah. Um, not my story. Uh, I, I, don't, I didn't get that man card. I didn't get to go on that rodeo. You know. Yeah. But that, what people don't understand those Navy saturation divers, like that is sort of like. I hate to like use the analogy, but like the Navy Delta Force were like, they're developing like top secret um, underwater systems that there's only like six of them in existence. They're, they're basically like NASA for the water. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. It's, it's amazing. And I mean, it, there's always the jokes about them where, you know, it's like, yeah, they'll shut you down to 300 feet, stick a, you know, uh, stick a probe up your ass and make you ride a bicycle. You know, in, in, a, in a chamber, they do um, they do human experimentation, like yeah. putting them on O2 on exercise yeah. bikes and like filtering different mixed gas through it, yeah, just to see how much bottom time they can get out of the human body. Right, like it's oh, and the thing is, like you know, the, the stories were always like if you went into sat diving, like you your body would never be the same. Like like we are just not set. Dude, up. There are dudes that are gone like 900 feet down. On saturation, on, on like mixed gas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then for each hundred feet, generally speaking, uh, I was told each hundred feet down you go, that's how many days you're in the hyperbolic chamber. Yeah, they, they, they'll spend, yeah, and, and chambers are fun, but they'll spend, yeah. Because, yeah, yeah I got to do the chamber ride because I went to the military free So they, so they, yeah, so they, yeah, 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 but yeah, the, uh, but anyway, I just thought that was a yeah. story. But anyway, let's yeah. continue. So, uh, so yeah, so um, when I left the Navy, uh, I stayed in the Guard. I was, uh, you know, I got out of Miami, so I stayed in San Francisco. Um, I actually joined an SF Guard unit there. It was when, um, I was 5th and the 19th, I believe. It was when uh, the Reserve, when SF had switched from Reserve to Guard. Um, so it was it was kind of a mess at the time, and they weren't getting guys to selection. Guys had been on the the training team for like two years, and so um, so in that time, I like bummed around San Francisco. I uh, uh, worked in a prison at Dacaville for like six months. I bounced at clubs, you know, um, did some home health care and nursing. I mean, I did whatever. Also, uh, this was right after the first UFC, uh, and so I was, you know, obviously fascinated by. Keep going. I'm just going to zoom in on you a little bit. Fascinated by um, Jiu Jitsu. How's this? <laughs> oh, that's great, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, good, I'm feeling that. Get my good side. No, it's just my head is really big, yours is really small, so I just want to make it a little more comfortable. Go on, go on, please continue. So, uh, so anyway, uh, so it was right after the first UFC, and you know that was something that nobody had ever seen before. So um, I found Carly Gracie, who was on the other side of the family from Hoist and Harney and all those guys, and started training with him in San Francisco. And so I had, for a long time, I had this really Spartan life of I was living in a like a transient hotel. Um, you know, with a, like a bathroom, you know, a bathroom for the whole floor. Um, and I would go and I would bounce uh, at this nightclub or kind of the floor manager at this nightclub and then I'd go train Jiu Jitsu. And that, that was my whole life at the time. Um, and then after probably about three years of uh, being in the guard unit, uh, I still had, I had been to pre-SFAS and I had been to like the PLUC and I had done all, you know, all that stuff, but they still were having a hard time. For whatever reason, they just weren't getting guys to SFAS. 
So um, there are a couple guys in the end who had been Rangers. And, um, and I was like, man, and it, so initially I decided that I was going to join the French Foreign Legion. Um, I so know, I had that moment. Yeah, so, so, so I, uh, <laughs> I sent off for all their materials. You know, they send you the packet and they send you the directions on, you know, take, take, fly to wherever and take the train to this station and get out and blah, blah, blah. Were you with us? Uh, this would have been around 96, 97. Okay. And, and I was like so excited. And so I was working, I'm basically working just to save up money for my flight. And in the interim, um, we used to have these things called bookstores. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so you could go to a bookstore and like read a book if you didn't want to buy it. And um, so I would go to like uh, these bookstores all the time. And I was like so into the French Foreign Legion. And I would just sit in these bookstores and I'd read books about the French Foreign Legion. And it was almost like to a book, it, it always ended, and they all died, yeah, yeah. and they all died. And so by, by like the fourth book, I was like, I'm not so <laughs> sure the French Foreign Legion is looking that great, you know? They kind of celebrate their like epic defeats. Yes, that's the yeah. thing, is it, that's the thing, is it, uh, like it's sort of the goal, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of like, you know, the, the old, uh, you know, uh, with your children on it, they're like, oh yeah, on it. It's like, eh. uh, so I was talking to, um, you know, a couple guys in my, in my, uh, sort of the SF training team, and, um, a couple of them were, uh, former Rangers, they didn't Ranger time, and they're like, hey man, you, like, you want to just go learn, like, if you just want to go soldier, you know, if you just want to go learn infantry tactics, because, you know, at the time, CQB wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't really, it was like a really niche it was, yeah, Right, right. And it was something that the Rangers were doing, like they were, they had um, their, uh, I can't remember what the, their, like, MTTs were called. Whatever. There were a couple of, their, there was SOT. Right, SOT. So, so, like, they had SOT and they had something like that. But their, their baby was still airfield seizures and, you know, and patrol, patrol-based activities and, 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 you know, kind of the anomaly stuff. Uh, and they were really, but anyway, they're like, if you just want to really learn how to be a warrior, basically, um, then Ranger's place to do it from the ground up. So it's like, all right, so I enlisted, um, very stupid, I enlisted within 11, actually, like, uh, which for those of you who don't know, I, uh, the 11 is the, the sort of the infantry MOS, but it's not necessarily a rifleman, or it's, it could be more. I could, you could be a Mormon, you could have been a Bradley guy at the time. Oh, um, shit. Motorized. Like, like I, it was a, it, it was a crapshoot. And then even if I would have gotten, um, but they, the infantry is the army. Right, right. <laughs> then, <laughs> right. Then even if I would have gotten 11 Bravo, there was no guarantee. You had volunteer for airborne school. And then at airport school, you had to volunteer for Ranger Battalion. Um, where, and I did that for some reason instead of just getting a Ranger contract. I have no idea why. <laughs> I have no idea why. Um, so I did it, and fortunately everything worked out. Um, so I went back to Army boot camp. Uh, it was my third boot camp. Um, and I didn't have to go through, I don't know, if like the first four weeks or five weeks, but I, I joined sometime prior to uh, like the right the life and uh, so life. maybe you go to EIT but not no not EIT I, I was just, it was still boot camp because I had to go and qualify so I still had to do like the last three weeks of army boot camp you know yeah because for the infantry it's come up right well I no no I had to do the last three weeks of army, army boot camp before EIT started I because you have to do the uh, rifle the rifle qualifications are in boot camp not, not AIT interesting. Yeah, so um, so I joined a, a boot camp class that was like halfway through, um, and you know, it, so when I got to army boot camp, um, first off I was an old man. I was, yeah. I was twenty seven. You were crusty. I, I was ancient compared to you know what I mean. Um, and then one of my buddies from my SF guard unit. Uh, sent me a care package and in the care package he sent me uh my hard hat badge or not the badge but the uh Ooh. the tab you know so i could sew it on uh and it, it wasn't just a hard it was a diamond so it was like 
nobody knew what the fuck right. it was. Um, he sent me a the uh, the orders, not the orders, but the um, the page, a copy of the page from the regulations showing that I could wear it. Oh, right. Um, because it was a, a service awarded, mm -hmm. you know, service award or a school or whatever. Um, and then he sent me um, like a couple of porn VHS tapes to give to my drill sergeants. VHS tapes were analog tapes that we put in a VCR. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so imagine the porn hub only on a tape that you put into a big box. Yeah. So, um, so I gave the tapes to the, the video tapes to my drill sergeants. Um, I uh, I had I don't remember how I got the I think they may have facilitated me getting my badge so on. So they were down with it. Oh, uh, they were so down with it because because uh, drill sergeants. I've never been a drill sergeant or a drill instructor, but there's like some real like competitive like shit going on because they they wanted me to go everywhere wearing it and, and then they would kind of follow like they would kind of like follow me and so when other girls were like what the fuck is that on you for you know and I'd pull out you know I'd pull out the rags and uh, I'd pull out the rags and then they'd start you can't wear that and then they would jump and go fuck you need to wear that so it was like it was like a game for them you know it was like <laughs> a game they, they put you out like they, yeah exactly see exactly. how many knife hands you yeah. get on the way to the chapel yeah so um so uh, so yeah, so then I you know I finished camp went through AIT, went to airborne school, you know, and, and made my way to to second range of the time. Uh, and so I uh, spent about a year on the line there and then did the rest of my time uh, in the sniper section. Uh, it was in a, at the time sniper section had just been moved from the line to to HHC. So we were at HHC on that. So yeah. When they consolidated the and created the sniper section. Right. Because previously it was like what you it was like part of weapons. I think it was part of weapons. And you had like two snipers per company or something like that? I don't know, honestly. That was, uh, the, I don't know how it was set up because that was before I got there. Right, right. So, um, yeah, and then so I did that. Um, and then I, I left Range Battalion uh, like um, somewhere mid 2000, decided that I wanted to go to college. Major in you know poli sci for some reason. Who does that? I don't know. I, don't, I didn't. Um, but I wanted to learn Arabic first for some reason. I thought that there'd be all these business opportunities in the Arabic world, and I didn't want to learn Arabic school. So I uh, joined another SF guard unit, uh, second nineteenth out in Canova, West Virginia. Um, but I joined their SOC A team, which is their SIGINT team. Um, so that I could basically, you know, basically I found somebody before I got off to do. I found I just called all over the country and found a unit that said, "Yeah, we'll send you to Defense Language Institute to learn Arabic." So I got out of Range of Time, drove out to Canova, West Virginia, from Lewis, did one drill, drove back to you know Monterey, California, and started DLL. Oh wow! So I spent 15 months there, and 9/11 happened uh, like right before I graduated DLL. So then I, but from there I had to go to the SIGINT course and, you know, my unit was, the people from my unit were saying, hey, you need to, like, we're going wheels up, you need to get here. Um, so I talked to the command at uh, Good, uh, Goodfellow, uh, Goodfellow Air Force Base, or, you know, my command. And so basically they just gave me like a test a day for like five days in a row. So that I can graduate the course, the singing course, and you know, oh shit, because I I've been in the course for a couple of weeks, but you know, but they're like, hey, if you can pass these tests, you know, whatever. So I got back to West Virginia. My unit had already been mobilized. Um, they were trying to do everything to get me individually mobilized. The uh, adjutant was like, you know, the general you know, was like, do this, blah blah. blah. Never happened. I sat. They they deployed. Um, they went to uh, Uzbekistan, you know, before crossing over. Uh, I sat in in the uh, armory for probably a month, Damn. you know, hoping that you know the state would mobilize me, uh, and they didn't. 
Uh, and the final match was like, you know, I gotta get in this time somehow, I don't know what. So the first thing I did is, um, I don't remember, it, it was online, I don't remember how I found it, but uh, I found sort of this, you know, interrogator, linguist type of gig. Um, and went, as a civilian, went to Guantanamo Bay for about three, four months for the interrogations. Um, and then... So you were involved in interrogating bad guys who were just pulled off the front lines yeah. of the war on the terror. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was fascinating. I mean, it was absolutely fascinating. And you really learned a lot about... Uh, um, about what motivates people. Mm -hmm. You know, because there, there were some true believers, but a lot of these guys were like poor dudes from Yemen who were never going to get a life in Yemen. Uh, and, you know, the Taliban in Afghanistan was saying, hey, come here, we'll give you a wife. Um, you know, you just have to fight. And it wasn't fighting Americans, it was just being part of the Taliban. And they would get there, the Taliban would take their passports and put them in, you know, whatever position, you know, virtue and vice, or, what, you know, whatever they were doing, they couldn't speak the language. So, so a lot of times they would just beat Afghanis for, you know, um, for breaking the Taliban's rules, even though the Afghanis couldn't plead their case because they yeah. just couldn't understand them, you know? Um, but, we, but most of them were just in it for the ass, you know? Yeah, it's really weird to talk to people. Like, it's hard for Americans to wrap their mind around that because, like, a lot of guys went to ISIS for the same reasons. And, like, the whole notion of, like, going to war so you can have sex is, like, something that, like, in the Western mind, we don't really get that. Oh, I think we still do it. I Only mean, now we do it with politics and we do it, you know, like, I, I mean, I, I think that, like, uh, I mean, yeah, I think we still do it. Um, going to war, yeah, yes. Yeah, but, but, but what I'm saying is, it, not necessarily like literal war, but I think we go, we were like engaged in sort of metaphorical wars. Or, or oh, not so like the time. Yeah, the flashy, sexy, like top gun type stuff. Well, not of that, but I think that, um, uh, you know, it reminds me of, I mean, I probably don't remember, well, Family Ties, remember with uh, Michael J. Fox, and he was a very conservative character, and one time he got like, he was at this uh, ERA or na a National Organization, some protest, and he was like there to like, you know. Um, oh, he, like, was like, he was like, he was like a counter, I don't remember the name, he was like a counter protester. And, and they all got arrested, he got arrested with them. And like, so, and, you know, he was against them. And someone goes, oh, you're so brave, blah, blah, blah. He's like, and when you realize, like, oh, today I am a woman, it's like, ah. I, I think there, there's a whole episode on It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Where exactly that, like Knack and some of the other guys, they go and they like join a protest movement to pick up girls. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, but yeah, you're right. The, the, you know, especially I think in in uh, in the Arab world where you know where there's dowry involved and where where the division of the sexes is so stark um, that if a man doesn't have any means, then he has no options. You right. Know? So there's no upward mobility. Yeah. So so the whole idea of joining the Taliban or joining ISIS or joining these things to get a wife. And, and you know, we joke about it, we say it's for ass and we say it's for sex, but it is deeper than that. I mean it's yeah. definitely It's social it, clout. It, you know? Well it's not just social clout, but I mean, people want to have a partner. Like people want like to, to have a, a mate, you know, it doesn't matter, you know. It's right, gay, whatever, like people want to be loved, right? right. And to give love. So, um, so I did that. Uh, so I was there for about three months, and then I got, um, because of my background, um, I was I was moved to uh, the Jasotif out in Afghanistan, and actually was there with my unit. Ironically. Uh, yes. Um, and uh, so I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan, all over the country, you know. Um, and then in 2003, uh, was part of the invasion, uh, all attached to the Siege of Sotif, or JSOC actually, uh, part of the invasion in Iraq. 
um, attached to JSOC. And then in 2004, I got um, uh, picked up by a, a CT unit, uh, you know, and so went back more into a direct action role and did that from 2006, 2010, both in Iraq and Afghanistan, like uh, six months plus out of the year. Uh, was that kind of like the culmination of like all this training you had received? On it it felt like it, you know, it felt like this very, you know, uh, I, I mean, I, a lot of times when people, I mean, not just in the military, but um, anything like, when people don't know what they want to do with their life, it, I'm just like, do something. Because you never know that you've done this and this and this, and they all seem so unrelated, and then one day they just sort of all come together, and like you, you find yourself in a place where everything you've done up to that point suddenly makes sense, you know. Um, so yeah, so that you know it, that was an amazing job and an amazing experience. I worked with, I mean, just the best. The best people out there. Do you want to talk about some of them? Because I've interviewed a few of them. You have actually, yeah. yeah. A couple. Yeah, more. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know. Um, it's up to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, you've interviewed a few of them for sure. Um, you crossed paths with others over the years. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of them go on to do you know, really great things. And a lot of them who you haven't interviewed you know, are. are Still out there doing great things. Still out there doing great things, you know? Um, so yeah, so I did that until 2010. Went through a divorce in like 2008. Uh, and then I just started kind of thinking that as much as I love it, and, and, and I'll tell you, it was it was by far the best job in the world. You know, it, it, for, for, if like you have an imagination, if you have like when you grow up and you think like action movies, you think of like, you know, you have all these things. Like, I mean, I was done. Like, I remember when I first wanted to talk to a recruiter, um, when I was joining the Marines, actually I think I talked to an army recruiter first. And, you know, I, I went in, I was like 19, I was like, oh, so I like on a special forces team, you gotta have like the knife expert and the hand-to-hand -hand expert. Cause that's, you know. Like the back of the G.I. Joe car. Yeah, exactly. He has this for stealth. That's and exactly and what I was <laughs> thinking, you know? That's exactly what I was, such an idiot. But, um. Specialization <laughs> demos. Exactly, like. yeah, exactly. Um, I just wanted to be the knife expert, you know? <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I wanted to get everybody with a prone knife. Um, Throwing knives. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, but it's like, I don't know. It, it was, like, you know, it's, it's just, it was a dream job. But it also um, was just a very narrowly focused job, you know? And, and I, I, you know, I'd gone through a divorce and I was kind of, um, you know, I, I felt like it would be hard to ever get in another relationship. Yeah. Um, deploying. Deploying and also not being really able to disclose a whole lot yeah. um, about, you know, whatever. And um, so, and, and then I also had just these like, I don't know, artistic desires, you know, at the same time I was writing, I had published some poems, I had published some short stories. Um, and so I was just kind of like, uh, I've done this, and this this is amazing, and I could I would be happy doing this for the rest of my life. But maybe there's more, you know, what else? Not more, just different. I remember you told me one time like you didn't feel like you wanted that to define you. Right, exactly. Which I think is true for a lot of us. Like I was in the army for what eight years, and it was a part of my life. But I also like I'm not in the army anymore. And I don't feel the need to be. Right. You know, I, I can do I can do this podcast. Well, do you, let me ask you, do you miss it? Um, there were parts of it, you know, because the things you're doing are seem so important and so impactful, so meaningful. Um, they're life and death, literally, yeah. on the line. Whereas like normal life is like just kind of boring. Yeah. And like a big part of transitioning from that life to this one is accepting like 
yeah, it's okay. It's okay for it to be kind of slow and boring sometimes, you know? You don't have to be chasing that adrenaline. Yeah. Like living in that state of like borderline <laughs> PTSD every day. Yeah. You know, uh, and that's, that, I think, at least for, uh, for me, the biggest part, the hardest part of transitioning into becoming a civilian is like setting aside that like adrenaline junkie lifestyle. See, for, I mean, that's a, that was a big part of it for me, but also like, camaraderie is, is a major yeah. issue. Like, like you, it's just so hard to find those bonds in a civilian community. You yeah. know, I, I feel like it's just so hard to find that and, and you know, to find those people. Um, and also, to me, like, I mean, I love, I, I love combat. I mean, there's just such a purity to it. Yeah. You know, like, there's no Bullshit. You're seeing real life, and then and then you get back out into the civilian world, and you know there, there's there's so much, you know there's so many social constructs that that you have to navigate, and um, I, I think for a lot of veterans, um, and, and particularly probably a lot of combat veterans. I think, or or even uh, even uh, people who have been in combat but aren't necessarily like, technically combat veterans because they weren't on active duty, right? When, when they were in, um, but for people who have been in combat, we'll say, um, I, I I feel like I don't even know if like I don't know that a lot of the, the suicide issue is as much post traumatic stress as just like an inability, an inability to deal with like the bullshit of mundane life. And, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Trying to find meaning, trying to find purpose, trying to find validity. Um, you know, at one point in time, it, your your skills, your prowess, your abilities were on display. And everybody, you had a hall file. Everybody knew, you know, everybody knew what you were good at, everybody knew what you weren't good at. And you were appreciated for what you were good at. Uh, you know what I mean? Um, and, and then you get out into the quote unquote real world and it's, there's just so much social posturing that has nothing to do yeah. with how competent you are in, in any given field. And I think that it's, it's just... And a lot of the things that make you a very effective soldier make you a train wreck in the civilian world. 100%. 100%. You know, um, yeah, I mean, it's not like you can go around calling Thunderdome on <laughs> people in your office. You know what I mean? When you're having a disagreement. Yeah, if you're in an office setting and like some like, you know, dude in a suit and tie is like, can I talk to you outside? Like, that means something very different in the military. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the tenor of that conversation is going to be a little different. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so, uh, Anyway, uh, so yeah, so I left in 2010. Uh, I moved to New York. I had, in the interim, from around 2008, like once my divorce was kind of done, I was like, okay, I, uh, you know, I, wanna, I think I want to do something else, but I still want to try to find a way to serve people. I don't know what that means. So I started taking like a lot of like coaching classes and executive coaching classes, like coaching classes. Like I spent a lot of money on them. And then in... Uh, was, was this like partly like trying to figure out your own path forward? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, that was my path forward. You know, because I, I didn't want to go to college to be like a psychologist or psychiatrist. I, but I didn't, I didn't know what else, I, I didn't know what else to do. I mean, I mean, you know, I, I didn't have any exposure to, to business, like when, you know, or, or, you know, like startup here in New York, you know, startups are a big thing. But if you're sort of outside that world, you don't really know how it works or how to get involved. Oh, yeah. Know? So, so for me, it was sort of, I've always been interested in that kind of stuff, you know. Like, and I'm, you know, I'm also not a good networker either. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm good at, like, finding people like you and, like, meet me pals and stuff. Yeah. But, like, as far as, like, business networking, yeah. I'm kind of, like, superficial. So, like, I'm, I'm not very good. Yeah. Yeah. It, it can be really tough. So, I started a coaching practice. Um, and it's actually pretty successful, um, and I did it for four years. Um, you know, uh, wrote a book, um, and 
I, 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 there was, there was something missing there and I wasn't sure what it was. And then I, I like, I was leaving my house, uh, one day to go see a couple clients, you know, one after the other. I was walking the subway. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I, I'm not, I'm just not enjoying this. And I think that I came to the realization that uh, I just didn't like working by myself. I don't mind being a, a boss, a leader. Um, but I really miss working in like a collaborative environment, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, so the clients that had you know contracts with me or whatever, like you know, I, I you know finished all that up, but I didn't pick up any new contracts. I just started working like Chinsey Security, but of course, I mean that didn't last very long because then all of a sudden I got you know, high paying EP gigs and everything, which it was its own fucking nightmare. Um, but also at the time, uh, I was like, well, if I'm gonna stay in New York, like it, New York kicks your ass, I'm gonna stay in New York, I'm gonna do New York stuff. And in high school, uh, I really loved um, like Saturday Night Live and comedy and stuff like that, so I decided to start doing improv. So I started doing improv classes and I did that for four years and I was on a great improv team, you know, called Classic Brady, and we, we did, you know, we. Everybody on the team was, just, we were all super dedicated. So we were practicing like 12 hours a week with different coaches wow. and stuff. It was crazy, yeah. Um, well, nine hours a week, I guess. Uh, two sessions on Sunday and one on Monday. And then, um, um, and we were just running strong for a long time. And then, then, you know, like we didn't really ever break up as a team. It's just that as an indie team, things happen. People start getting better at gigs, you know, people start, you know, moving on with their career, like, which is supposed to happen. Um, and then I just got very fortunate that one of my teachers, um, who is also a friend of mine, Anthony Tamanek, started doing a Trump impersonation during the, uh, during the primaries. And, uh, and he's like, and he knew that I was working as a bodyguard. He's like, hey, you want to, you know, uh, and I was working as a bodyguard at the time. so. Uh, he goes, you know, you want to come be my secret service guy. So my job, basically, uh, I mean, I didn't pay for it. I don't even know if he got paid for it. But my job, basically, was to stand behind him in a suit and try not to laugh during a show. And it was just, it was just amazing. Um, and then when Trump won the election, he actually had a show on Comedy Central. So then he leveraged that. And he was like, hey, make sure you bring this guy on. So... I was on a number of episodes, just, you know, a little bit part as this, you know, Secret Service guy and his little digital short segments and stuff, which, you know, got me into SAG and then I started, and I was like, okay, well, I mean, I'm not in SAG, but I'm eligible for SAG. Um, and I was like, okay, well, I'm here. Uh, why don't I take some acting classes? So I started doing that and got a commercial agent and then had booked a couple of commercials, and, you know, and working on a screenplay and, you know, doing the projects. You know. So, yeah, it's just... That's, that's my life. Have you ever met uh, Terry Scapper? I don't think so. He's a SF soldier. He, he may have just retired, actually. I'd have to ask him. But he went to acting school here in the city, I want to say pre-2001. Okay. Or like maybe he was in acting school right around that time. But uh, I should probably connect you guys. And he's done shows on like Netflix and stuff. Oh, really? Like yeah, he, he's done some pretty funny stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you're a casting agent, uh, <laughs> you brought him up. Uh, so, um, but yeah, so, uh, and you know, auditions, I got in a motorcycle accident not too long ago. I had major surgery to put my arm back together. It still doesn't really work. So that's how things on hold a little bit. But um, but you're still doing, uh, like, auditions and commercials? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I booked two commercials this year, and then, uh, well, one at the very end of last year and one this year, and then had my accident. So I haven't, I haven't done any commercials or auditions since my accident, but I'll probably get into it soon. I'm actually going to do a commercial tomorrow flying out to LA. I can't talk about it because I signed an NDA. Nice. Um, and talk about it after it's done. Yeah. But it's not it's not an acting job. I'm not an actor really at all. So uh, I don't think my talents are there. But they're just going to interview me and it may end up in a commercial. We'll see. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah that's fantastic. Um, did they? Did you send in for that or did they reach out to you? My agent out there hustling. Nice. Yeah, yeah, nice. doing a good job. Yeah. It's, um, it's, I don't know, I, I, I've found acting, because uh, I've done some indie films and things like that also, and I've 
Found acting, I, I love it because it is also, it's a very collaborative thing. You know, you have the crew and the other actors and the director. And I noticed that when I did a TV show for the Discovery Channel. I was like, this is the first time, like, I felt that same sort of feeling like I when I was in the army because it's like, this is a team of people that's like working together and you have all these pieces of technology yeah. that you have to get to work in tandem with one another. Yeah. It was a similar feeling in a strange sort of way. Yeah, one hundred percent. You know, one hundred percent. And I look. Like, I, I don't. I don't think there's anything wrong with comparing things to military. I, I don't think anybody is saying, uh, "Oh, that's like being a combat." You know what I mean? Right. It's just that like you're in a team trying. It, it, it was the combination of like people and technology and trying to get it to all work at the same time. Well, and it's also like people with a common goal trying to make it happen. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, working together, everybody bringing their their skills and their talents. You know, I'm, and, it's, and, and it's not even just skills and talents. I mean, if you have a good PA on set, you know, who, who's helping out the talent, like they make all the difference in the world. Like, it, like everybody makes, everybody contributes and, and makes a difference on, on a set. You know what I mean? Um, if somebody's not doing their job, then everybody suffers from it. And it's one of those things where like when you're on set, uh, it's like my experience, it's we're just goofing off a lot because it's like one of those things like you're just really frustrated about yeah, you know. Oh, and it's yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it's it's hard, and it, it's not hard like ranger school hard. It's hard like arduous. You know, like it, it, they're long days. You film the same thing over and over and over and over again because they want different angles, or they want this, or they want that. You know, like um, it's it's not hard like you know like being a construction worker. That's hard. You know what I mean? It, it's. I mean, I, I look, it's hard. I, 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 it, when I say that, I'm solely saying it as like a spoiled American who, you know, who like, well, I mean, it, we'll find anything to bitch about. It is hard. I mean, it's not, it's not hard like being a woman in South Sudan at all. But it, it's, right, right. It's a challenging job. It, right, right. It, it has its unique sense of challenge. Sure, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, and if you work with like a bunch of people who have no sense of humor on set, like, well, in, in my case, too, because it's quote-unquote reality TV. It's like, Jack, just be authentic. Just be you. Just be authentic. Uh, and then, like, I get, like, 10 seconds into something, you know, or, 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 all right, just say this. <laughs> it's like that back and forth all the time. It's like, it, 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 I just take a deep breath because, it's like, I'm not a TV guy. Yeah. But whatever you need me to do, is, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. That's my approach. And I, I've been pretty spoiled, too, because, like, one of, uh, there's a, uh, I, through just a random thing, um, a class project, I met uh, a young director named Brian Chen out at NYU, and we really hit it off. And so I've done a number of projects with him, including a short film that wasn't connected with. Was that the zombie one? That's the zombie one, yeah. I like that. Like, I, that was like, I didn't realize, you know, like, you have some, like, depth to you in that. It, because it's not like you're running from zombies. It's like you're you're you got bit. You're gonna die. Is that is that like the whole plot? Like, sorry, but I, I mean, the, the, no, the plot, yeah, yeah, like yeah, you're yeah. sitting there having this very like kind of like subdued conversation with the with this woman. It's not uh, yeah yeah my daughter yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. and, no, it's, no, you didn't you didn't uh, you didn't spoil it. Uh, but yeah, the, I mean, but see, and that's that's the thing is it like. Um, when I say I've been spoiled, it's because he's such a great director, and he's he's very open. Like if you're if if you know if there's a line in the script or a scene in the script, and you're like, look, this doesn't like I don't I don't feel as though maybe this is how people talk, or or, or maybe we didn't earn this, or whatever. It's like okay, well let's improv through this a few times and see how it might come out naturally between two human beings. And so we'll do that and go, okay, all right, let's, you know, he'll cut it all down and go, okay, let's do this. And, you know what I mean? And, and just to have, I don't know, that type of support as opposed to, well, you know, it's the same thing as like an officer in, in Ranger Town, right? It's like, you have some officer like, hey, you got, like, how, how do I help you guys do your job? And you have some officers like, I don't pay you to think. Hey, yeah. exactly, I don't pay you to think. <laughs> yeah. So um, it was very, very much the same way. Um, so yeah, it's, it, up to this point, like acting has been, been very, very helpful, you know. So, um, but yeah, that's oh, that's really cool, man. Yeah, thanks for getting into it with me. I, you know, um, actually, one other thing, 
there were actually there were two things I want to ask you. One of them was this concept that we had talked about a while back is that technically, like we want to split hairs about it, you're not a quote unquote veteran because you were a security contractor. Well, I'm a like, veteran, I'm not a combat I'm not a combat veteran. Right, right. And like to me, this is like super like splitting hairs because it's like, okay, you were over there choking on the same dust that I was. Right. Although the, the, the difference is, you know, I was a uniformed American soldier, you were a security contractor, technically. Like, do you want to talk about Because that's like a really weird dynamic. You know, I, I, I have, so, I mean, I guess it's, I mean, I don't really think it is a, I think a new combat veteran, I, I think that it, it's a, a, I think it's a very specific thing that you were, in the in the armed forces, um, in combat, and you know, and there were a lot of other people with different organizations. Like, for instance, you couldn't say that somebody who, um, for instance, was like they had FBI out in Afghanistan, like right? they had DEA out in Afghanistan. Yeah. Well, if somebody was in the FBI and happened to go on a DA raid with uh, with a uh, SF team, they couldn't say they were a combat veteran. They're not going to get a CID. They are they're not going to get the right, benefits. Right. So, so while I'm not, I mean, if somebody who were, if somebody in that capacity said they were a combat veteran, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like jump on them. I wouldn't care. But in terms of what language I use for myself, and like I, I don't want to mislead people, you know. Right. Um, and we also live in this like, I mean, there is like a snowflake culture within veterans, like the way we go after. Sure, each other, sure. Over fucking anything. Sure, we absolutely yeah. will. You know, I mean, we absolutely. Will. And there, there was. Um, I'm gonna need a copy of DD two fourteen. Yeah, yeah. The, it's classified. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's classified. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> um, you know, a few years back, there was like uh, 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 a big sort of in the veteran community, in, in the soft community, um, special operations community. There, there, there was an info around a, a person who said they were a combat vet, and by definition, the legal definition, by the definition, they were not. Um, and a lot of people came down very hard on that, and I saw that, and I was, and and, and I got like, it's true, you know. I mean, by the legal definition, I'm not a combat vet, and so, and I, I'm okay with that, you know. I'm I'm okay with like not trying to claim that name. Um, you know, I can say I'm a veteran. I can say I saw combat. I, you know. Whatever, and you know, that's, I mean, come at you, you know, whatever. Did that turn into like a problem for you when, you know, you had been in combat overseas and now you're going to, like, like I, I'm trying to get what I'm getting around to is like, as far as like claiming VA benefits and things like that, government services, has that been a challenge for you because you technically are not a combat veteran? Um, well, I don't, I mean, you know, I have VA benefits just based on the fact I'm a veteran. From your time from my time. Navy, Army, Marines. Right. Um, and then I, you know, haven't tried to really claim any uh, benefits, you know. I mean, I, I mean, I put it for a VA claim, you know, for my knees and something. I mean, mm-hmm. I got rejected anyway the way the VA does, you know, because <laughs> being a Navy guy or being an Army Ranger doesn't, doesn't do any bad damage to your body at all. But, um, but you know, I mean, there was really nothing happened. I, mean, I never got shot or anything like that, so there was really nothing that happened to me that, um, you know. Um, what, what about some other guys who work with the same organization that did get shot or maybe have PTSD or like they, it, it, is there like alternative services? I honestly don't know. Um, I, I think that different organizations handle that differently and uh, because I, Fortunately, you know, never had to worry about that. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what, what the the remedies are. You know, that, that they have. 
The, the other thing I wanted to ask you about was, um, and while people can go and see it for themselves, is you did that speech, uh, War is My Guru, yeah, War was my that guru. I, re I really enjoyed. Yeah. And you were talking about how like you had gone through all these different layers of the military, and you're always like, chasing the next big thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, you're like, 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 like happiness and success is like always over the next bridge line. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, like, I think that a lot of guys who go into special operations, well, I think that people, look, I see a lot in the active world too. You know, so many people are in the acting room uh, to prove something. It's like the insecurity. Yeah. Right? Well, I, and I don't want to just say insecurity because because I think that I think that insecurity trivializes it, right? I think because there are a lot of guys in special operations. There are, are insecure guys in the special operations community, but I don't think that insecurity is the is the motivating factor for them. I think that. Uh, um, for, and, and look, we're all we're all different. We're not, it's not like this homogenous group of like you know everybody's doing everything for the exact same reason. Um, but for me, I'll say for me, uh, there was always this idea. It wasn't about insecurity so much as it was about trying to feel worthy. Like when am I going to feel like I have accomplished? Like I have proven myself. Um, and then finally, I just got to a point where I realized I would never feel that. Um, and made peace with it. You know, I made peace with the idea that it's, that it, my self-worth can't be based on um, any type of achieve, achievement or whatever. I mean, can you imagine what it would be like? Imagine this. <clears throat> imagine somebody, some 30-year-old who wins a Tony Award, right? They win a Tony Award. And then for years and years and years after that, and, and imagine like how everybody must treat them, how, you know, everything like that. And then, let's say they never do anything, like make any grounds again after that in their life. That, or an actor who wins an Oscar, or, you know, or even somebody who, I mean, look, uh, wasn't it Buzz Aldrin who had like alcohol problems? Um, alcohol problems? Some used cars. Like, like what do you do after you go to the moon? And drink it and You know? Like, you can't, and that's the thing, that's one of the things with the transition. I, I don't believe that there's a such such a thing as transitioning from the military to the civilian. I, I believe that um, you have to reinvent yourself. And, yeah. and, and, and it's not about like, I mean, I'm proud of being a veteran, you know, and, 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 and you know, I'm, you know, like, it obviously defines a massive part of who I am in my life. But I also, if I try to hold on to uh, not being a veteran, but it, like nobody's ever going to give you respect for that. Like, I mean, people will pay it lip service, and, and there are people who, you know, I appreciate your service and things like that. The thing is that's that's ancient history for me now. Yeah. And and if if I'm still you can't keep chasing that, man. It's not healthy for you. No, you know? no. Yeah. You know, I mean you, you just you have to find something new, you know. Um uh, you know, the idea that uh, who is it? Um, those who have a why can Yeah, it's a horrible quote, uh, and it's not always a great quote, but I'm doing a horrible job. But he has a a a, a, a why can um, can endure anyhow or whatever. You know what I mean? Like like we have to find new passions. I mean Victor Frankl. I don't know if you have, have you ever read um, Man's Search for Meaning. Mm -hmm. So Victor Frankl was a psychiatrist um, who uh, was interned in concentration camps, and he was sort of already like kind of. He had sort of all this idea of a new form of therapy or what motivates people. But the thing is, like, while he almost turned, like, concentration camps into his own sort of model for, for uh, psychotherapy in that he could tell when people had given up. Like, he could tell who would, who would not, 
obviously not. Well, you must have seen it so many damn times. The, the thing is, yeah. is that people who have a reason, people who said, I will see my wife again, I will see my kids again, I'm going to be a constant man, people who had a reason would, could endure. You know, people who didn't, people who lost their reason, people who didn't, never found a reason, people who gave up on their reason, just faded away. You know, they would stop living. And, um, and I think that happens to a lot of veterans. And, you know, and I, I, I would venture to say that the suicide rate, you know, 22 a day, isn't even the tip of the iceberg. Uh, there are a lot of veterans that are committing suicide by fading away. Yes. You know, like, th- I don't even, I, I think that we would be staggered by the members of veterans who, they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna kill themselves. They're not gonna take active measures, but, but they're not, they're, they don't keep living. Well, I, I see it with some of the Vietnam veterans. Um, you know, you hit 70 years old, uh, there's some PTSD issues, there's some alcoholism issues, but I mean, the, the total human cost, you have to look at, you know, failed marriages, you have to look at the, the um, children that won't talk to him anymore, all this stuff has to be factored into it. I mean, one hundred percent, and 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 that's a seventy. I mean, I think this is happening to to people in their thirties, yeah, yeah, no, 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 yes. in their mid twenties. You know, um, you know, like I, I mean, we could we could you know there are people who like make fun of sort of the military bro culture. You know, like you know a, a lot of the comments come out that or whatever, but it's like, man, whatever you can do to 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 find purpose to create yeah. meaning, like what. No, I, I make fun of those people too, um, but at the same time, you have to look at it like, what is that about? And it's like, on one hand, it's about trying to find a sense of like belonging and a sense of brotherhood. It's an appeal to brotherhood. It, it is an appeal to brotherhood. I definitely feel that way. You know, um, like I, I, I don't wear my veteran status on my sleeve. You know, uh, really, I, I don't. You know, it, it's not something that. Um, uh, it, I, 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 it's not something that I like, really, really put out there uh, yet. I mean, maybe someday I will. And, and but, but at the same time, I, that's only because that's because I'm not doing it or whatever. Like I don't, I don't have any. Um, I think if people are doing that, great. Like, like just live. Like find whatever it takes. You know, just live and, and have fun and find joy and yeah. make money and you know. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I, I don't begrudge anybody anything if it's if it's bringing them joy and they're not harming, you know, right. other other people, not consensually, <laughs> you know. Um, so um, yeah, I, 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 and, and that's the thing is I, I don't, you know, in this, in this age of identity politics, I feel like as veterans we can be as guilty of playing it also, and even amongst ourselves, you know. You know, and I, I'm not saying that we can't rag on each other. I mean, because that's part of the That's part of the yeah. You know, like, I mean, I'll talk shit about SEALs all day long um, because they deserve it. But, uh, <laughs> but, but the thing is that, um, but, but there, but that's, that's not, that's not what I'm talking about. You know, I'm talking about like this, this real like eat our own type of thing that, you know, is really sad to see sometimes. You know, mm-hmm. um, we all have to like. None of us are perfect, and I mean, we, we all make mistakes. And the thing is, that, like, it's funny. It's like we uh, we look at other people and, and see what they do, and say, like, "I would never do that." It's so fucked up. It's like, yeah, I would never do that, I mean, but I do shit. Like, I do shit. I do shit. Like, I wouldn't do that, but I do shit. So it's uh, I like I I try, and I'm obviously I'm not always successful, but, you know, I, I try to, to be empathetic and compassionate when, yeah. when people are doing things that I may not, you know. Yeah, sometimes I feel like Sam Jackson at the end of Pulp Fiction, where he's like holding a gun in the guy's face, try real hard. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> well, because, it, because, you know, the thing is, is it feels good being mean, especially if you're being mean with a group of people. Like, you know, if you mean girls, yeah. If you there, there's real satisfaction in uh, uh, 
humans want to bond. Like, you know, I, I know for myself, I like being part of a group. I like being in collaborative things. If, and, and the thing is, is that like, even like with Republicans and Democrats and you know, commies and Nazis and all this other bullshit, man, that stuff goes back to a chess club versus a checkers club in high school. Like any time, you know, the way, the way we, uh, the way we form bonds with other people is through similarity, you know, through commonality. And so in order to reinforce those bonds or to emphasize that commonality, what we have to do is find what's different. Right. The yeah. other, the other, yeah. you know, and as, as long as we can find the other, man, we, man, we've got, we've got community and everybody wants community. Yeah, it's like something just hardwired into our DNA. Yeah. It's like well, we, it, we have a little tribe, and then like the other tribe we want to like cave their skull into the rock. Right, right. Um, you know, and the thing is, like, I'm not a pacifist you know, at all. I just, and it is hardwired into us. And I think that that's, that's the thing is it. I mean, I can be as mean and petty and vindictive and you know, whatever as anybody else it, it's, uh, and self-righteous and, and everything else. It's just that I try when, in, in those quiet moments when, when, when I'm not reacting, to to yeah. I try to be self-aware of it. And, and I try to, uh, you know, uh, put myself in other people's shoes or, 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 or think, like if this were my best friend who thought this or said this, how would I, would I still respond the same way? Because sometimes, like our best friends will do shit and be like, ah, oh, that's not time, man. What are you doing? Come on. And then, and that's it, you know, or whatever. But um, yeah, so you know, I, I mean, that's, you know, we started the the D and D stuff together, mm -hmm. Dungeons and Dragons, you know, and I, I played Dungeons and Dragons or some sort of RPG since I was like in middle school, and and that was one of the things. And that's one of the joys of starting back up is that um, it's collaborative. It 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 it, uh, it it's a group of us against hopefully not the DM, you know, but against a, a, a foe or an opponent. Um, and it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter if you're a veteran. It doesn't matter if you're a liberal. It doesn't matter if you're a conservative. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. You know, just play the game. Just have fun. Yeah, if uh, if I can, because I did I was one of those weirdos that went to school major in political science. And if I, I get my my poli sci hat on, like, and not to like blow a a, a a RPG board game into something it's not, but it does provide a forum where people can come together as civil society and have like this affinity and this thing you do together, which is like so important in life. Because uh, because of everything that we have talked about previously, like you have to have some way to relate to the people in your society, because otherwise we're caving each other's skulls in the rock. One hundred percent. Well, and I, look, I think that RPGs, uh, you know, role playing games, tabletops, um, board games, like I'm not anti video games. I love video games. You know, having you know, and those are one form for other people. It could be softball or something. Yeah, right, right. One hundred percent. Yeah. One hundred percent. You know, I, I you know, it, uh, so this isn't like an anti-video game message because I love video games uh, and I love online games and stuff like that. But I do think that there's something to be said for, uh, you know, especially RPGs where it's a collaborative effort, um, bringing people together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and face to face, because I, I, we say horrible things to each other online. I mean, we just, <laughs> yes. we say shit online that, that we would never say to another human being in their face. You know what I mean? Like people telling, like, telling people, like, go kill yourself. And like, uh, yeah. You know, it, it's, um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's so, it basically, do you, do, you, do you have road rage? Do you get road rage? No, I don't. Oh, see, I do. Like, yeah. I will, man, I will cuss people out. I do. You motherfucker, blah, blah, Now, if... I would never, you know, like, talk to somebody... And, and I don't get... I, I'm not saying that I'll roll down my window and yell at them, but in my car, you know, if they're cutting me off, like, 
Well, no, there have been psychological studies done, and that probably happens, road rage happens, because people are in their cars and they don't see each other. This, and that's what I'm saying, and that's the thing, is that being on the internet is basically like everybody's in their car cutting each other off all the time. So everybody has constant road rage on the internet. Yeah, it's you know what I mean? Because you, you're, not, you're not really yelling at a person. You're yelling at a driver. You're yeah. yelling at a car. The human beings were never, ever designed to be thrown into these like huge social media outlets. Like we're all just thrown in there together and it's a fucking feeding frenzy. Like psychologically, we were not designed for that. No, no. We don't know how to handle it. No. Well, it brings out like it, it brings out our tribalism, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, right? And it also brings out our narcissism. You know, yes. it really like look at me, look at me. Yes, and especially and it rewards our narcissism. You know, so um, by the way, like and subscribe to <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Share it with your friends. Hit that bell for you so you get notifications. All right, go ahead. Please validate me. <laughs> um, give, give a thumbs up. But it, but it definitely, like, um, you know, like, man, it, it, and we lose all nuance. Uh, like, if I can just completely dismiss somebody by calling them a communist and saying they hate America, why do you need the troops, Dave? I know, <laughs> but, but you know, if, if I can, you know, if I can just with a dismiss somebody, then, then how? Look, we we need both the left and the right in this country, right? We, it's like the heart and the brain. It's like the the pragmatic and, and, and it's the yin and the yang. You know, it, it's, it, it, it couldn't. Yeah, they need each other. Yes, they need each other. And like, imagine if one ever became the predominant power, like. Then they would have to deliver on all their bullshit promises. Like the whole system, the whole well, system would collapse. It, like, but the thing is that they wouldn't. They, they would immediately split because because nobody. There's no such thing as a Democrat. There's no such thing as a Republican. Like it's it's this multi ordinal thing, which is like I agree with this 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 this, but I agree with this. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you can't. There's no there's no platonic idea of, of what. Well, that yeah, there's are made of ideologies. They're made of ideologies. So. So the thing is that, like, if if one side of the Democrats or Republicans like became the supreme power, they would immediately split <laughs> based on you know multi-ordinal points. Yeah. Um, and you gotta blame somebody else. Like, well, that's, that's, like, uh, that's the thing. I mean, man. I mean, blaming other those people. guys over there. Exactly. Doing their jobs. Exactly. Blaming other people. I mean, it's it's definitely. It, it's you see, you see, even you know, with with presidents. I mean, both uh, President Obama and President Trump have both pulled that card, like pretending like they have no power over anything. Oh, those guys over there! It's like you're the president of the most powerful country in the world. Like you do have some things you can do. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, it fascinates me too, just to watch people line up uh, ideologically behind a politician because. Politicians are, are servants. They are not. And they don't like you. They don't, they don't, none of them care about us. They, you know what I mean? It's like, like none of those people come and like hang out and like play D&D with I, me. I, I, would, I would venture that every politician has left office with far more money than they went in with. And there's no corruption in Washington, D.C., Dave. You know, stop making shit up. And, and so like for me, it, it's like, you know, I don't want to get my own personal politics here because they're really... Unimportant, like it's like I'm nobody, like it's irrelevant. Uh, but I would say that if if I supported a politician, if, if you know, if I supported them, and somebody accused them of a crime, you know, whether it's Trump or Hillary or Obama or, or Bush or Clinton, if, if somebody accused them of a crime, I wouldn't defend them. I would say yeah. I want to know if that's true. Yeah, yeah. I, like I, I, you know, like I believe that the left should be policing the left, and the right should be policing the right, and because they can't police. You can't police the other side. You, you, have no, you have no authority over the other side. You can only police your side. Well, yeah. you can. You can weaponize DOJ. Now, now you're getting a whole other crazy thing. Well, we don't, we, none of us want to see that happen. No. No. No, no, no. Um, but anyway, yeah, I just, um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I think that, like, everybody should post everybody's opposition files and Look, your candidate, whoever that is, is human. So they make mistakes. They're going to have fuck ups. They're going to do things that you don't agree with, whatever. So you don't have to fall on a sword defending every single thing they do. Yeah, yeah, that like, cult like behavior. But that's, that's back to the tribalism aspect of it. Like, I understand, like, 
you voted for Trump, you voted for Hillary, you know, you were, you were in the same position as everyone else in the country, you had like two idiots on the ballot, you know, I don't pick one. Like, I get it, but then, like, to defend, like, every dumb thing that person right. does, it's like, why are you doing this? Like, like, do you own stock in that dude's company? Right. Or, like, is he paying your mortgage? Right. Like, why do you give a shit? Right. I never got and, and it's funny because it, it, now we are so, like, anti the other party that, like, it, you know, Trump decides not to bomb Iran, and liberals are, are like, out of their minds about it. And it's like, when, when did liberals become hawks? Or yeah. AOC, she just came out with this thing where she wants to get rid of DHS, uh, you know, the uh, Department of Homeland Security, and all these liberals are like, ah, she hates America. It's like, uh, no, that was not the conversation but, but like, in 2001. But, but, the thing, the thing is that, like, Getting downsizing the government is a conservative position. Like you can hate her all you want, but how are you going off on yeah. a position that that is a concern? Like that's what I'm saying. Is it like it, it's? I saw a meme the other day. It's funny. It's like when when the worst person you know like says something you agree with. You know, it's like uh, 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 you know, it, like we, we we are in such sort of um, you know this tribal nature and and sort of this knee jerk, and we have so much. Um, What's, what's the term I'm thinking of? Um, it's sort of the sorrows, uh, the oh, polarization. No, it's, it's um, no, when, when, like, what you actually do doesn't really line up with your beliefs, but you just fight anyway. Um, oh, like cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. We, we are, as a country, in such cognitive dissonance right now that, it, that our, our, our political parties don't even have platforms. It's just, yeah, yeah. It, it's just, Anti whatever the other party is doing. You know what I mean? Day to day, hour to hour. Hour to hour. Yeah, hour to hour. Minute uh, to minute. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like societal level mental illness. Yeah. Things. You know, you, you see in one hand, like, it, it's okay to boycott, you know, it's okay to boycott a company and then, then, then it's not okay to boycott a company and then it, it, it's like, I don't know. Like, this can't be your lives, man. You know, like, I've seen uh, some of, like, the late more recent scandals, quote unquote. There was the whole thing with the Betsy Ross flag, Nike pulling our chain on that. Uh, then there's the whole thing with the soccer player saying she won't go to the White House. And, like, I see this stuff in the news, and it's just like, I don't care. And, and you know, here's the thing is that, uh, like, it, it, like, Trump going into North Korea, right? So, you know, the conservatives said one thing about it. It's amazing. It's it's historic. You know, it's, it, you know, all this. Uh, the left is saying, oh, hey, look at him kissing a dictator's ass. Yeah. You know, whatever. If that had been about Obama, the, the, the sides would have been completely reversed. So, so you know, the, the left would have been like, oh, look at this. It's historic. It's amazing. The right would have been said, yeah, I think you're probably right. About that. You know what I mean? So, so basically... Nobody, if, if you would have, if you were to ask a person, I mean, Obama went and reconciled with Cuba, and that was seen as a huge accomplishment at the time. If, if yeah, yeah, if, yeah, I mean, I, so, yeah, but, but I, 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 I just, the left, the right, left, we criticized. Right, right, <laughs> that's what I'm, that's what yeah. I'm saying, though. Like, he reconciled with a dictator or what, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so the thing is, is it, if you were to ask a person on the street, hey, what would you say if the president went to North Korea? You know, or any politician or any president. I don't think, I don't know if they'd have a platform. Like it, nobody knows what they believe until the, right, until right. nobody knows what they believe until, until, until like somebody does. until somebody they like does it or somebody they don't like does it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's if you think about it, I mean it's impossible. I mean really impossible to have a foreign policy that functions in such a schizophrenic way. Oh, yeah. I mean, how in the hell do we maintain, like, we're dealing with some serious issues that are generational in scope. Yeah. From the war on terror to uh, dealing with the rise of China. Now, I mean, this is a question that's going to occupy the next 100 years. Yeah. Now, how in the hell are we going to deal with that when, like, we're all over the damn place day to day? Right. Well, and it's interesting because I remember talking to a really smart uh, analyst overseas one time, and um, she was telling me why she she was basically explaining why um, our 
foreign affairs, you know, was basically always destined to fail. And, and it's because in America, like when a president gets elected, well, used to when the president got elected, like they knew they were going to be in office for four years. Like there's not going to be a coup or there's not going to be whatever. Um, uh, so, and then we've always had that in America. You know, the only, the only people who have any semblance of an idea of what it's like in another country are, are people who live there who've left other countries to come here. Um, so, so when a uh, president, you know, smiles at another politician, or, like, we give money to other, you know, countries or whatever, and we don't understand that a lot of these politicians don't even know if they're going to be in power tomorrow. Right? So they're, they're all playing short games. They're all, you know, they are all like, if a president smiles or winks at, at another, you know, a foreign leader, that goes, we have no idea what that means to them. We have no idea what they do with our aid. Like, they're just, we can't, we cannot, like, deal with them at a level that we would understand because we can't understand how their their grill power is so tenuous. Except for like, you know, um very professional diplomats with a lot of experience right. in or right. intelligence professionals. Right. But yeah, I agree that like most Americans just don't understand. And, and I would say most of our, and I would say that most of our like, you know, Congress and you know most most oh, Congress of Jesus. Like, like they don't they don't you know. Yeah. 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 Speaking of which, we do have a few viewers, so if anyone has questions you want to ask, ask now and we'll try to answer. Yeah, sure. One person did shoot one over here, said, speaking of China, do you guys have an opinion on the Chinese infiltration in Google and other social media? And, uh, I mean, for my part, obviously, that's a major concern. Yeah. It's a major concern that Google is over in China, that they work on programs, that they won't work with our Department of Defense, because that's bad. But they will help the Chinese Communist government set up this like Panopticon state. Like, that scares the hell out of me. And those sorts of like ethical questions, again, that is, these are the questions of the next 100 years. These are the questions of the 21st century. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, uh, uh, so I think Gen Z is, um, I'm hoping, uh, is going to be like the savior of the human race. I think, you know, I, I mean, like, you know, people blame millennials for a lot of, why melodrama, no, melodrama and, and stuff like that. But the thing is, is that like, I can't imagine the pressure of growing up with social media the way they did. You know, we didn't, we grew, we didn't have it. Like, they had to invent like a whole new way of being, and and they had to do it while they were kids. Um, so I, I think that Gen Z is going to, you know, more savvy. Uh, and, and the reason I say that is because this comes back to like China and Google, but it also relates to like. Facebook and YouTube censorship and you know deplatforming people and all this other stuff is it? I think that our tech companies are going to get. I think we're going to see a lot of regulation in the future with tech companies because I think that they they they've, there's you know they they become a combi- they they become a combination of the public square and Big Brother all at once. Um, and so far, I think they've avoided that because they've collaborated with governments. Um, play that game well, but I, I do think, uh, and I think there's actually some upcoming hearings of there are, yeah. on antitrust issues. Yeah, there absolutely are. You, you recall in the 90s, Microsoft got called yeah. the carpet and they ended up splitting up some aspects yeah. of the company. Yeah, and so, and so with, you know, uh, you know, with, especially with the, the cyber threat that we have and, you know, how, how easy they've shown it, to, it is to Manipulate elections, regardless of how you know, regardless of what you think, who is responsible, and things like that. Um, yeah, I, I think we're going to see some some really heavy regulations. Which I don't know. You know, it's unfortunate. Uh, I, I don't know if that's right or wrong. It's unfortunate we got to that point, but yeah. But it's almost it's almost getting to the point where it's a mess, a necessity now. But the problem is, is that the government, being the government, once they take power, they they don't. Yeah. They never. You know. I mean, this is like one of those subjects where, like, I, I feel like I'm almost aligning with the campus communists because I think they would argue that the social media giants should be treated as a public commodity or a public good and all nationalized. And like, I'm kind of at the point in my thinking with it that, like, yeah, I don't know how comfortable I am in having a solely private entity with purely commercial interests literally steering society. 
and, 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 and I want to kind of agree with that. And, and on the flip side of that, it's also... No one's forced to use Twitter or Facebook. But, but it's also like once they, nas- once they nationalize that, like you, you never get a fair shake from the government. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like nationalized social media sounds like a fucking nightmare. You know, to me. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, but but it, I, the, the comparison they make is like to the post office or PPS or something. Well, see, I 100% agree with like treating it like a utility in, in that sense. Um, you know, it'd be like AT&T uh, uh, banning communists from talking on the phone. Right? I mean, it, it, I, and I think that's one of the big arguments right now with, with, uh, with social media is, are they a platform or are they a publisher? Right. And they're trying to play it both ways. You know, they're trying to, all the benefits of a platform uh, with all, you know, with, with, you know, the benefits of a publisher. And it's like, well, they're, they're, basically they're sinking themselves. You know, they're, they're sinking themselves because they're human, you know, they're, 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 it's not a company, it's, it's a bunch of humans. Uh, we had uh, Vincenzo talk about how I mentioned Operation Gladio on the last episode, since he'd like to see an episode just on that topic, which is a huge controversial topic. Maybe I can do that at some point. Um, also, he's asking, how much knowledge do we have about China's special operations? And I think we, we know a bit about them, although it's a very secretive government. Um, but also, the thing you have to understand about the Chinese is that they are not trying to replicate the American way of war. So the Chinese aren't really interested in creating like JSOC or uh, you know our special operations units. They're, they're not. They know they can't compete with what we do, so they're creating different capabilities to go around with what we do. That, that's the simple, very simplified answer to that question. So. They do have special operations units that would be very involved in, um, say, recapturing Taiwan and then training for so called decapitation strikes um, and things like that. So they would play a role in that, but I do not see the Chinese trying to recreate um, the sort of JSOC industrialized counterterrorism programs that we have. I don't, I don't think they have any um, motivation or intention to do that. Um, do you have anything? No, nah, I mean, I, I think that they. I mean, obviously, their their intelligence operations are also geared much differently than ours. You know, I mean, look, they they can infiltrate most countries, you know, and have uh, with almost no issue. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, yeah. Um, the the intelligence aspect is a much much bigger threat yeah. than the special operations aspect yeah. of what they bring to the table. Um, also asking, uh, worst and best weapon component to work with? Uh, in, like over, overseas, what was the best and worst weapon that you worked with or weapon system? So that's hard to say. Um, best, I would say the collection of hands down. And I, I, had, I had a whole podcast in the past with this with uh, Jeff Kirkham talking about the Kalashnikov. Why do you, why do you prefer the Kalashnikov? Because the thing is just like, it's bomb proof. Yeah. You know, and the ammunition and the magazines are all over the, the battle space. That's true. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, the Kalash fits the bill. And I'm not saying the M16 is a bad weapon or the, or the Venom 4 is a bad weapon. It does a lot of things good and it does some things better than the Kalashnikov. Um, but if I could only pick one, <laughs> it would be the AK. Um, the worst weapon to work with over there? I don't, we have a lot of problems with PKMs, but I think it was just those particular weapons were just shot the fuck out. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, and, and the ammo, like, the quality of the ammo, like, it's, you're never really sure. Um, the non-discriminating metal link belts are a huge pain in the ass. I mean, I love throwing about grenades, but that's just me. Favorite? Throw American grenades? Yeah. No, I, I, I had them, I didn't use them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, let's see, what else do we got here? What do you think about that missile the Italian police found in possession of uh, in the far right group? I actually wrote an article about that today, of the elevator. Um, so, yeah, the Italian police uh, raided a neo Nazi group, and they had whole shitload of ammunition and weapons 
But interestingly, they had this French-made air-to-air missile that was sold to Qatar. Really? And it was a, it's like a fucking, I can't remember the, the nomenclature of the missile, but it's a huge fucking missile. It's like 10 feet long. It's a huge damn missile. So, and it's like, like that they were keeping in like an apartment or a house in some city in Italy. It's like, what the fuck? Where did that come from? They're just using it as a paperweight? They were trying to sell it on WhatsApp. That's hilarious. And I wonder if it came from Libya, but I maybe we'll find out. Huh. Um, I mean, when I say that's hilarious, it's also that's terrifying, but, you know. The, uh, it, it, it sprung from an investigation they were doing into Italian nationals who fought with Ukrainian separatists. Okay. And came back home. And it's really, it was a really interesting thing to contemplate. Why would European ethno-nationalists be fighting with Russian separatists to invade Europe? This is like one of those really weird counterintuitive things. And by some accounts, they were probably doing it for cold hard cash. Mm -hmm. Not much, like 350, 450 euros a month. Um, but I have a, a friend who um, is a journalist, and he covered Ukraine from both sides of the conflict. He was able to go hang out with the Russians. And he met Western volunteers from countries like Italy, Germany, even, even the United States, who were fighting with Russian separatists. And I asked him, like, why in the world would they go and do this? And he's like, you can't understand it by using our logic. Like, you will never understand why you're there. He's like, I would talk to them, and they would be like, oh, well, the Rothschilds have taken over Europe, and the Jews control everything, they're putting chemtrails in the sky. So for them to go join up with Russia is to fight back against this, you know, Jewish conspiracy. Really? Yeah, I mean, it's weird as fuck. But that whole conflict is weird. I mean, you have Nazis who fought on both sides. Yeah. You have Chechens who fought on both sides. And it all makes sense based on their personal right. agenda. Right, right, right. But like as a, you know, I consider myself a fairly normal guy. Like yeah. I'm outside looking in here. It's like, what the fuck yeah. is going on here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I guess that's it for questions. Um, I don't know, anything else you want to get into, Dave, before we, before we kill it for tonight? I don't think so. We can do it again, yeah. you know, and if you're interested, you can even come in here and host some shows. I'm going to be actually uh, away for a little while this summer, so. Okay. You have opportunities. Nice. You learn how to work all this software and hardware, which is interesting. Terrifying. I, I mean, I, it, you know, I rely on my military experience once again. My, my belief that I can slog through a manual for hours on end and eventually teach myself how to do something. And work and, and that's how I figured out how to use all this, you know, streaming software and hardware and all these cameras. Because I know nothing about audio and video yeah. or any of that shit. Yeah. I, I just bought myself. And you can see from the stream, it's, it's okay, but it could be a lot better. So I have a lot to learn. <laughs> but that's amazing. Um, for everyone who tuned in, thank you. Um, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. We're going to try to keep these things going, keep doing live streams. Um, some of you asked that we turn it into an actual podcast with just audio. That's a whole other can of worms. Uh, I'll, I'll work on it. I'll investigate that, figure out how to do that, and maybe upload them to SoundCloud. Maybe there's some way to just rip the audio. Oh, I, I'm sure there is. Right off. Uh, there has to be. Yeah, there, there are mics for each person. It's just they're, they're up here. You can't see them. Um, like, you know, a normal radio show, they're like right in your face. So maybe you can get better sound by lowering them or putting them on the desk. I don't know. We'll figure all that out. But anyway, yeah, subscribe. If you haven't subscribed, hit the bell for notifications. And um, thanks for tuning in, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Hope you enjoyed uh, having Dave as our special guest today. And thanks for coming in. Oh, I'm man. This is cool. We could, we could keep going for like another hour, I know, but we've already been going 93 minutes. Yeah. So. Really? That yeah. That's yeah. Amazing. We'll save something for next time. Yeah. Uh, and we're saving the good stuff for next time. Yeah, exactly. And because I self produce, now I have to go around and cut the feed. But hey, you get the you get the real authentic thing here on uh, 